So uh, I will introduce our first uh, panelist. Igor Pantic uh, is an architectural designer and educator based in London and the founder of Studio Igor Pantic Limited. He works at the convergence of computation design, digital fabrication, and immersive AR VR technologies, exploring the ways in which these disciplines influence how we design, make, and perceive built and virtual environments. Igor is a lecturer at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL in London, where he is teaching at BPRO Architectural Design Program, leading the research which focuses on the application of mixed reality technologies in architectural design and fabrication, operating at the overlap between low-cost AR-assisted fabrication and automation. He is also a lecturer at the University of East London, UEL, where he is teaching MMARC Unit 6. In addition to this, he has lectured and taught computational design workshops and seminars internationally, and has previously co-directed the AA Visiting School in Vienna. Prior to establishing his own design studio, Igor spent seven years with Zaha Hadid Architects in London, during which he worked on a large number of high-profile projects across scales. Igor holds a master degree from the Architecture Association Design Research Lab, AADRL, in London, and the Faculty of Architecture, University of Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, let's please welcome Igor to the stand. <clears throat> All right. Hello, everyone. So my name is Igor Pantic, and the uh, title of my talk is Architecture for the Augmented Age. Um, since I was so nicely introduced already, I'll skip through this page. And uh, I would start my lecture uh, with a short video by um, Australian futurist uh, Brett King. Over the last 250 years, we've seen a lot of major disruptions as a result of technology. For the machine age, it was the steam engine and later the combustion engine bringing on the end of the industrial age. For the atomic and space age, it was nuclear energy and taking men to the moon in these uh, massive rockets. The digital age was all about computers, electronics, and in the later stages, the internet. Is this encyclopedia or National Geographic? But the next age, the augmented age, is going to be about you and I and the way we live our life. And over the next 15 to 20 years, Almost every aspect of the way we live our daily life is set to change. So we are entering the augmented age. Um, what does that mean, basically? Um, it is predicted that in the future, um, kind of the skills and capabilities of the workers and designers are going to be augmented in two major ways. One would be through hardwares and mechanical devices such as exoskeletons and so on. And the second way would be through sensorial devices or kind of mixed reality devices and wearables. Um, and obviously when we talk about kind of extended reality, um, what, what I'm interested personally in my work and research is kind of the uh, wide variety between um, umbrella between virtual reality, augmented reality, and merged reality, or mixed reality with specific focus on the, on the later. Um, but these ideas are nothing new, right? Um, kind of um, Sensorama, the first, let's say, uh, augmentation device uh, was built in 1962, um, as well as the Sword of Democles by Ivan Sutherland in, from 1968, which was essentially kind of a, a precursor to um, all the uh, AR devices that we have today. Um, and finally, some of these technologies are finding their way um, into different kinds of industries as, um, you know, aids in education or uh, tools to help in kind of fabrication or just uh, in communication between digital models. Um, and also um, mixed reality or AR Augmented reality technologies are finding its way slowly through to, into our lives, right? We can um, see them now in video games, Pokemon Go, in, in a lot of kind of um, art projects, and, and just in many different ways how um, our daily lives and, and reality are augmented through series of um, virtual overlays.
and also um, an important thing that this brings or the use of, of mixed reality technology brings is that it liberates us from um, constraints of our 2D screens and allows us to completely immerse, our, immerse ourselves into the 3D models and, and the, the work that we do. Uh, but so what? So what does this mean for, for us as architects and designers? Uh, what do we have to benefit from this and, and how can we use this technology? Um, if we go back in time to a kind of mid 20th century, um, when, when um, 20th century avant-garde was imagining buildings as machines, right? Um, from the work of Archigram Group, uh, as well as uh, Metabolist Movement in Japan, um, some 70 years later, we are getting to a situation where we are using machines to build buildings, right? Um, automated construction has had a tremendous advancement in the last 15 or so years. Um, advancements in uh, 3D printing, um, robotic fabrication and assembly, drone assembly, autonomous robotics, and so on. Um, but what about us? What about people? Uh, what about kind of the craft and knowledge that was developed over millennia. Uh, what about traditional craft and um, ways of making which are either too difficult or still impossible to be programmed uh, to be executed by robots? Um, in, in our earlier research at the Bartlett uh, from period of, let's say, 2015 to 2018, uh, together with Sumin Ham, uh, Daniel Widrig, and Stefan Bassing, um, I was leading research cluster six, where we were focusing on a lot of these, let's say, traditional crafting processes um, with obviously, uh, uh, in conjunction with computational tools, uh, with, with the intention of, let's say, using non-architectural materials and turning them into um, specific architectural objects through kind of traditional crafting processes. Um, but in a way, um, we noticed that, that let's say a disconnection at a certain point where either generative models or physical models were trying to kind of catch up with each other. Um, you wouldn't be able to, let's say, uh, manually produce or handle the, the complexity of the data that you could generate with generative models, whereas generative models would often just be, let's say, representational in terms of what we could achieve with um, material uh, computation. Um, and then, so how to bring all these ideas together, right? How to bridge automation on one hand side and, and material craft. Um, so we looked at augmentation, right? But not as, a, as let's say, um, opposition to automate, automation, right? But rather as a, uh, the other side of the coin uh, where we don't have a question of man versus machine anymore and, and fear of kind of being superseded by machines, but rather a collaborative process of man and machine, um, where now, as you can see in this uh, example from a couple of years ago by Fologram, um, now we don't need a, a expensive robot anymore to just kind of lay a parametric brick wall. Uh, if you can just kind of provide already experienced bricklayers with the exact same, same data visualized um, through holographic projections, right? Or um, you could achieve essentially the same level of expertise uh, from someone who absolutely had no experience but can just follow kind of very simple instructions. Um, and then basically that kind of leads me to, to um, the first topic in which um, kind of my research into mixed reality goes and it's mixed reality assisted fabrication. Um, and um, our, our first, let's say, completed project uh, with this technology, which was a steampunk pavilion um, built for Tallinn Architecture Biennale in 2019 in um, Estonia, which was a collaboration between uh, Sumin Ham, um, myself, and Gwil, Gwilim Jan and Cameron Newham from Fologram. And basically, <clears throat> The competition called for kind of a design of a pavilion structure, which would be built in front of um, 
Estonian Museum of Architecture and, and stay, stand there for two years. And the only, let's say, um, limitation, besides obviously the budget, was that it has to be built out of timber uh, with kind of the idea of promoting local timber industry. Um, so our pavilion was third um, in, in the line. So the previous two pavilions built by uh, Sile Pilak and Sim Tuksam in 2015 and, and Gilles Retzin in 2017. Uh, we looked at them and um, obviously kind of wanted to do something completely different, right? Looking at uh, the ideas of previous two pavilions, which deal mostly with, uh, let's say, a kind of uh, discrete assemblies and, and um, uh, those types of geometries. Um, we wanted to kind of go beyond that and, and do something else with timber that usually you wouldn't really see in architecture, right? And, and this was kind of a render which won us the competition, uh, but also um, warranted a lot of questions, like how are you actually going to build this? And not very many people believe that we're actually going to pull it off. Uh, but the whole idea was to build it by using uh, steam bent timber, uh, which is usually, I mean, it's extremely old technique, right? But uh, the problem is that it usually requires very precise two-part molds, right? Um, and if you look at our render, that's obviously not going to work. Um, so our idea was kind of in a competition stage. I mean, it's going to be very simple. We're just going to place a couple of these uh, temporary brackets around a central column, and we're going to be able to kind of bend um, timber strips around it, uh, clamp it, and everything is going to be great. We did a small test during the even the competition stage, kind of just to prove, uh, prove the concept. And um, the idea was like, all right, we're going to build it in several chunks and assemble them all on site. Uh, how difficult can it be, right? Um, so after winning the competition, we were very lucky um, to have a chance to test these ideas, actually, at two workshops. Uh, this was one at Temple University, uh, where we essentially wanted to test this idea. Let's build it out of kind of um, the, the whole piece is going to be built out of three meter long timber, um, timber boards. We're not going to have any material waste. Um, we're going to connect with these brackets, and it's going to be great. And it looks pretty good on this image. But actually, it's almost a meter off from the 3D model at the end, right? And the, con the reason for that is the spring back that you get uh, after steam bending timber. And, but that meant that our idea of you know, making 10 chunks and assembling them on site is absolutely never going to work, right? Um, so then we were lucky again to um, be invited to University of Aarhus in Denmark, where we tested now a slightly different approach. Um, let's basically use strips as long as possible and always land them into the ground. So this required a bit of redesign. Uh, to the whole pavilion, but basically we knew that if we can um, kind of constrain both ends of every strip into the ground, we're going to minimize the spring back, right? Um, but this obviously meant that now um, we're going to be dealing with extremely long elements, and, and we had to overcome that in a different way, right? Um, now having these strips of you know, up to 15 meters uh, meant that we would have to start combining multiple timber boards into one longer board. Um, and we would have to know, or we would have to make sure that the overlap joints are outside, let's say, the areas of the highest curvature. Otherwise, it would kind of break during the, um, the bending process. Um, and, and then the bending process itself, uh, we also abandoned, let's say, steaming in a steaming chamber because that would mean that after you take a tim piece of timber out, you have around 45 seconds to bend it before it's too cold. Um, so we used a, a very old uh, technique used in boat building where we would essentially put the um, kind of create a, a steaming chamber uh, out of a plastic bag, uh, which would allow us essentially to. Uh, keep steaming and bending timber while we are um, still working with it. 
And while, let's say, as you see in the video, while one of the pieces is steaming, uh, we are using, again, HoloLens uh, to walk around and place these uh, very simple formworks in kind of increments of uh, 10 to 15 degrees. Um, and uh, as, as you can see, a bit of the process there. And then we would start uh, the bending process. Uh, and as you can see, we are still kind of carrying around the steamers. Um, and, um, you know, in the ideal world, maybe each one of us would have would wear a HoloLens, um, but in this case, we could afford, um, you know, for steaming only one, uh, which maybe wasn't actually that bad at the end uh, that we figured out. Um, because if each one of us had, had their own HoloLens, everyone would have their opinion uh, where to bend, when to bend, right? Um, but this way, you, you could just, uh, you know, have one person essentially direct the rest of the team. Um, and obviously, I mean, the video that you see is kind of the nice one with, with enough people, but there were moments also where, where, where it would be just three of us uh, trying to kind of carry these steamers and, and bend at the same time, right? Um, but basically, uh, and, and this is how it would look like, let's say, at the end of every day, right? During the day, we would uh, steam four to five these long elements, leave them to dry overnight, uh, take them off in the morning and repeat the process and like that for uh, four weeks. Uh, it was a bit of a laborious process, uh, but essentially, let's say, you know, if, if we had more space that we could bend more pieces per, per day, the whole process would be shorter again, right? Um, and then, um, I, th I think I can also skip through this a bit. But yeah, I mean, the, knowing that, you know, the, the whole process is gonna be very, let's say, high tolerance, right? It's um, you saw our adjustable molds that they obviously require a bit of um, tolerance. Um, so in the same way we were designing the brackets where first we would kind of um, approximately place them where, where they're needed and then uh, kind of uh, rationalize on, and, and adjust the geometry until we get a straight line uh, so we could essentially make them out of um, stock material rather than having to water jet cut or anything. Right, so um, yeah, uh, so in, in essentially was kind of a timber shell uh, in one direction having the timber strips and in the opposite direction these uh, steel brackets which each one was unique, right? Because all of the kind of uh, timber elements were unique so the relationships between them were never repeating. Um, so again, that also uh, was a perfect chance to, to use uh, holographic guides in the process. Um, where we kind of hacked into this super cheap bar bender um, and used it for, for bracket bending, where we would just visualize the current and the next position, and you could see how you need to bend, right? Um, so essentially, so far, not a single drawing was produced either in steam bending or in bracket bending process here. Um, and then, of course, uh, kind of the third part of the project, the on-site assembly, um, was following kind of the same idea. Yeah, as, as you can see, um, we would visualize kind of uh, the whole structure and essentially um, uh, each step uh, and each strip, how they would be assembled. Um, and we would obviously, we would not be assembling them kind of consecutively, but we would place, let's say, first and, and um, at the last of the strips which hold the brackets and then kind of place the, the bracket, place the strips in between. Um, and you can see actually how some of these strips look once they're reassembled on site. Um, and, and it doesn't really look like you could put them back, but now because of such a long length and, and kind of pre-steaming, um, they, they all kind of fit pretty nicely at the end. Um, but we also realized that in order to stabilize the whole structure, we had to fabricate a couple of additional brackets on site, uh, but we could not use the 3D model for that anymore, obviously, because there was, you know, there was obviously a bit of movement. Uh, so we re-digitized only the key elements or the key, let's say, strips, uh, which would, were built, bring them back, back to Rhino, regenerate new uh, brackets on site and bend them on site and kind of install the whole thing, right? Um, 
and basically, uh, you know, um, this was kind of sort of a, quite a big milestone for us. It, it showed us that there is a potential uh, in using uh, mixed reality technology in fabrication on architectural scale, right? That we can bring, take it outside of, of university and, and our workshops and actually build something, um, uh, something real. Um, I think that's it for this one. And then, <clears throat> so obviously, you know, we, we, we understand uh, steampunk pavilion is, is, you know, it's very sculptural. It, it's not very, let's say, um, spacious or, or doesn't have a lot of kind of spatial properties. Uh, and that's something that we uh, uh, try to address in our uh, second version um, designed by Sumin Ham and myself uh, and, and built and exhibited in SciArc Gallery in 2021. Uh, so essentially built during COVID, which was kind of a perfect uh, way to, to prove uh, the use of this technology, right? Um, so uh, this piece called Steam Odyssey um, was, let's say, you know, obviously it was a bit smaller in scale because uh, it also had to fit in the gallery space, but it was imagined as, let's say, an evolution of Steampunk Pavilion, where uh, it would be sort of a chunk of inhabitable space where we were thinking, right, so if this could potentially, let's say, become part of an enclosure, uh, we thought about designing this, let's say, double skin now, uh, or, or double surface, where we could use the, the infill in between um, for insulation or kind of, um, other wiring and so on, um, um, and obviously kind of cover the, the outer layer uh, for waterproofing. Um, so uh, design-wise, uh, you can see sort of quite a, a simpler design, but let's say a bit more controlled and, and with a um, intention of um, bringing this to a full, full architectural scale. Um, but, um, Something new that we did here, and and you know I'm not going to be showing again the whole fabrication process because obviously you already saw it in steampunk. Um, here, as as this was an exhibition, um, not just kind of an installation, uh, we designed the whole exhibition experience also in uh, augmented reality, where you could use um, your phone or or uh, iPad to essentially enhance your exhibition experience where uh, you could load these 3D models in one-to-one -one scale and see uh, certain additional information which was not there present physically, right? Um, so this was quite an important thing for us to kind of start thinking how uh, mixed reality can also now really influence or start merging with um, our real environment. And um, these ideas are, are something that uh, we've also been um, researching and testing with our students at, at the Bartlett for the past uh, five or six years. Uh, Sumin, while she was at the Bartlett as well before uh, leaving to SciArc, and then myself uh, with Alvaro Lopez and Jose Pareja. Um, and uh, basically, the, those, they're, they're these two kind of uh, major streams of research that we conduct there. Uh, one is uh, mixed reality assisted fabrication. Um, and the second stream, which kind of started during uh, pandemic times uh, when we didn't have access to uh, fabrication facilities anymore, which was these, uh, let's say, um, mixed reality uh, immersive environments, right? Where, where we are looking at the ways of how can we use mixed reality to enhance our experience of the city and, um, and the environment around us. So not just focusing on fabrication, but also, let's say, on um, understanding of, of our cities. Um, and just kind of, I'm going to give a very quick overview. I'm not going to be talking about now each project in details. Uh, just kind of a couple of ideas uh, that, that are going through this research. Um, obviously, you know, using uh, mixed reality as uh, holographic guides, how to produce things, but also uh, how can we interact now with the uh, computational models uh, where we can record, uh, let's say, any changes in the fabrication process, use them 
to reinform our digital models and then kind of feed them back uh, into the, the, the assembly uh, line. <clears throat> and um, sorry for this. And then uh, continuing also um, at the same time, which one? Uh, continuing kind of the research into uh, different ways of uh, working with timber uh, with mixed reality. In, in this case, it was a uh, kind of um, series of, of laminated uh, timber elements rather than um, steam bent timber, uh, but also looking at the ways how now mixed reality can be used in the design process as well, where in the videos at the top you can see students kind of using um, QR codes to move and redesign these uh, digital objects, which would be then later on translated into first foam, but then also um, timber, timber elements. <clears throat> and then as well, um, kind of looking at the ways, we just like to kind of explore multiple materials and, and what are the ways in which mixed reality can, let's say, corrupt the traditional uh, uh, ways in which you use those materials. So um, another project was looking at a um, way of creating, let's say, porous ceramic elements, right? Um, instead of kind of casting uh, or, or um, doing those kind of uh, ceramic pieces, we looked at ways how you can first assemble the, let's say, these frames uh, with, with the AR, but then also use them as a guide of how we could weave um, uh, threads, uh, which would essentially then act as a substrate for clay. Uh, so then it would be dipped into uh, the clay and create these kind of porous uh, ceramic pieces. Um, unfortunately, we never had larger prototypes because this project was started pre-COVID and then uh, finished during COVID. Um, so uh, the, the fabrication um, capabilities were limited. But another thing that, that was interesting here was uh, a question of, do we always now have to just follow uh, what the hologram shows us? So are we now just literally you know, being the tools uh, who assemble instead of robots? Or can we reverse the process as well, right? So um, in this case, uh, the students were looking into, right, what if we don't follow what the machine is telling us, but we start recording our weaving patterns and then feed them back to the machine with potentially essentially the idea of creating a large database um, of, of different weaving patterns, which could then be used to, uh, let's say, train an AI model potentially. <clears throat> um, another project uh, executed during, during COVID um, was, um, let's say kind of um, reconfigurable uh, metal molds for um, concrete casting, uh, where basically we used uh, hologram, holographic guides in order to fold these metal sheets and then assemble them into um, castable molds. And, and this was actually cast in China during COVID, which was pretty amazing. Uh, we kind of never really expected for the students to cast anything, but uh, they just told us like one day, hey, we found a factory which is gonna do it. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then going back to one of the, the our older projects from a couple of years ago, um, sometimes we like to revisit some of the older ideas and, and uh, do them, uh, look at them in a new light. Uh, so this was a project from 2016, which was looking into um, use of uh, sawdust and uh, stockings, essentially um, constraining sawdust in, in uh, nylon stockings, uh, pinning them uh, with uh, thread and dipping them into PVA glue or wood glue, essentially creating kind of a new timber composite. Um, but there were two issues, right? One was it was extremely laborious. Um, and second one was that essentially only if you're really, really trained and you know you spend six months doing this, you're gonna make something that looks good, right? Um, and also kind of uh, uh, that at a certain point, like it needs quite a big frame to support until it's dry and so on and so on. Um, so what we essentially wanted to do here is 
We use uh, mixed reality first as a way to guide you through the stitching process, right? kind of how to achieve all those interesting patterns, uh, but also combined with our previous research into um, steam bending and, and timber, uh, where now kind of the timber elements were used uh, as a way to um, resolve the, the interface issues that the older models had. Um, so that's kind of, that's it for this uh, uh, mixed reality fabrication direction that we, we were looking at. And now, because uh, I'm slowly running out of time, so I'm just going to be a bit faster. Um, immersive environments, mixed reality plus um, <clears> plus, <throat> which is basically, if the video just starts, right, which is the idea, okay, so how can we now uh, totally overlap the digital worlds and, and, uh, enhance our real environments with uh, digital data uh, that we can interact with. Um, <clears throat> so a project called XREF was looking at essentially the idea of creating event spaces in the pockets of the city. Uh, so there are digital spaces that you can experience through um, you know, AR glasses or whatever, uh, but you have to be physically locate, located at a certain spot, right? So you couldn't access these spaces uh, through virtual reality. Um, and, you know, obviously at this time we were kind of, uh, you know, the, the students were um, developing these geometries that they would use to populate um, these spaces with, uh, you know, different algorithms. <clears throat> and thinking also how something like this could actually be used also to, you know, redesign your interior, that you can wake up in a different room or different living room every day, obviously viewed from through uh, mixed reality glasses. And then obviously all of these creations which would be uh, user contributed, you could upload on the cloud, exchange with your friends, and so on. <clears throat> but then also we started looking at kind of the ideas of, of multiplayer, uh, where it's not about, you know, just a single person walking around the city with uh, silly glasses on their head, um, but essentially trying to create a community where um, not only the f uh, person who is doing it in, let's say, first person, but you could also join as a third person or, you know, kind of follow the stream uh, real time, but also engage in this collaborative uh, process of let's say, um, um, creating virtual graffitis all over the city uh, with your friends, right? Kind of um, on, the, on the video on the left, you can see a bit of, you know, the standard kind of um, segmentation model and, and then kind of assigning different kinds of textures and elements for, to different um, parts of the buildings. Um, <clears throat> and then kind of what, what are the ways that, uh, how can you apply now these um, overlays, right? Is it just kind of a, a 2D uh, wallpaper or it starts getting certain three-dimensionality, right? And that's kind of something that, that we kept going between back and forth in, in these couple of years. Then AR, AI, AI, AR, uh, how can we combine these two? <clears throat> so um, obviously now if we are proposing these ideas that, you know, you're creating a platform for people who in, in five to 10 years when everyone has these uh, mixed reality whole, um, lenses, for example, and now you're proposing and telling everyone, look, you can have a different city and see something else that your friend is seeing every five minutes. Um, how do you then allow them or, or enable them to create that variety, right? Um, so we found, you know, for us, there was a problem in kind of the XREF project that I was showing before that, you know, it was, it was just a design library. Right? So how many libraries are you going to design and pre-describe to the users um, if you are really creating geometry? Um, so this was kind of now like four years ago. This was quite rudimentary, just um, uh, uh, um, picks to picks and, and style transfer. But the idea that you, know, you could, instead of creating overlaying geometries, you could overlay any kind of um, style. Right? Um, <clears throat> but um, what was a bit more interesting for us in this case was that, um, you know, th these ideas were obviously now you can recognize, you know, the window, uh, um, a 
tree and so on. And you can add things, you can kind of overlay things, but you can then start thinking about removing things as well, right? So this kind of brings a bit of, you know, Black Mirror-ish vibes where, um, you know, what happens, right? In kind of, in a ideal world, uh, we are all, you know, walking uh, in our beautiful ideal cities and, um, you know, maybe King Charles walks in kind of 18th century city. Um, but what happens if, if there's a bit of, bit more sinister um, play behind it. How do you know that these overlays now that you are seeing are not controlled by someone, right? Or not imposed on you, right? Um, who is the creator of the content? Is it really just the user contributed? Or is it perhaps, you know, a paid content, so we are walking in a Coca-Cola city for a week? Um, or is it potentially government controlled, right? Which then, you know, brings a lot of questions which, you know, we, we don't really have answers, but I, I believe they're just kind of very interesting things to talk about. <laughs> and then obviously, um, you know, as kind of the, the whole boom of uh, generative text to image AI models happened last year, uh, we thought that, hey, maybe that could actually be an interesting kind of answer to these problems of how and who creates the content, right? Where you just allow um, let's say user, um, you know, and their grandma uh, to walk around along the street and um, prompt a bit and create uh, a building for themselves, right? I mean, obviously virtual. Um, but then the idea was like, all right, so is it now again just these uh, wallpapers that, that you smack across the building? Or you could also add um, 3D geometries through uh, certain kit bash models and so on, and then kind of combine these now new geometries with the AI overlays. And you know, kind of for me personally, the, kind of the, this is quite interesting in terms that I'm not necessarily kind of extremely comfortable with some of the designs that, that are shown here, but you know, it, it is essentially what would happen if you kind of um, provide a tool like this, right? Uh, and, and for me, that's a super interesting question where like now if we as designers are providing tools like this, how much you can pre-describe and how much does it make sense to pre-describe before the tool becomes kind of essentially unusable unless it's, you know, for a group of uh, your friends who like the same stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> And then moving on a bit from that is that obviously now what this allows us is to essentially have animated overlays, right? So we don't have to walk around static cities anymore. Uh, now we can start imagining that our um, environment is constantly changing, uh, constantly animated, uh, be it exterior or interior or uh, the Bartlett Cafe. And then finally, I think this is gonna be just some time. Um, so the, the last project that I'm gonna show is bringing now this idea of, of these uh, digital um, entities which are created and, and brought into mixed reality to a, a bit next level, right? Um, talking about, I'm just gonna go back. Um, starting to think, okay, what if these uh, digital overlays are now actually uh, sort of living things, right? Kind of as in, in the game's real wor uh, rain world or altered carbon um, uh, poor uh, butler, right? Um, so what if you actually, these, these digital overlays that you're creating, what if they are NPCs, right? So what if you're creating this ecology of um, kind of digital elements which you know, merge with your real environments and, um, you know, then start talking to you potentially and, and um, uh, provide certain information around uh, about the city or the place. Um, so, wait, is it this one? No, next one. And I'm just gonna play uh, for four minutes a bit of this video, and I hope you enjoy. The virtual overlay and the real-time environmental data it further cements the virtual overlay's relevance to the contextual overlay. The prototype experimented with housed humidity, temperature, and light sensors. Additionally, the wearable was equipped with haptic feedback motors to further immerse the user in the cyber-physical space. These inputs affect the generated texture's color and the generative geometric growth behavior. The virtual realm mirrors reality not through approximation, 
but through an immersive understanding. The humidity of the air translates into the glisten of virtual surfaces, the chill of the wind conjures up the movement of bodies, and the light of the sun paints the virtual cityscape with a palette of hues. Users wield a key, unlocking the door to an environment shaped by environmental data, seamlessly interwoven with imagination. They immerse individuals within vast, autonomously driven worlds inhabited by NPCs, each endowed with unique personalities and responsive dynamics. Thanks to the creative prowess of large language models, this transformative evolution resonates beyond entertainment. The process involves prompting the personality of the entity or NPC using three factors, the architectural history, current events, and environmental inputs from wearable devices. Hey there! Welcome to the Curve Gallery. I'm here to show you some incredible exhibitions that have graced this space recently. Sure, I'd love to see them. We have Carrie Mae Weems. Her photographs delve deep into the African-American identity and experiences. I remember seeing that. I loved that one. Check out the Masculinities Exhibition. Artists challenge traditional notions of gender, presenting a diverse and thought-provoking take on the subject. Hey, how was your day? Welcome back. It's been rather quiet without you. You know, I was thinking about our conversation yesterday. Ah uh, yes, the one about parallel universes. Have you ever wondered if time loops back on itself like moments are trapped in an endless cycle? Time might be more intricate than we perceive. What if time is a mosaic, not a river? Each brush stroke of laughter, each stroke of sadness, they blend into an artwork that is us. This mosaic captures the essence of our journey, illustrating how every shard of time contributes to the masterpiece that defines us. Just as a mosaic, our lives gain meaning from the rich medley of moments woven into our personal fabric. So there was the project My City, My Friend uh, from RC9. Um, just kind of finished two months ago. And uh, with that, I would finish my presentation for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we, I think uh, we can uh, open up uh, the floor for questions, discussion, and it can be uh, fairly informal. If uh, anyone in the audience has any burning questions to ask right away. Yeah, you stay here. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep you in the hot seat. All right, all right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Should I say that? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Hi, um, I First of all, I'm not an architect or a designer. I'm a musician, so I'm kind of the odd person out of the room. Um, but I really appreciated the way that you talked about power structures and agency in relation to access to, to a lot of these tools. Um, I work a lot with um, augmented and adaptive technologies in large ensemble environments. And actually, when you were talking about the HoloLens and the steam bending process, it reminded me a bit of a conductor. Um, and so I was just thinking about in particularly large collaborative teams and low resource settings, how do we use this technology in ways that doesn't just kind of replicate and reinforce existing power structures that lead to inequity? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's something I'm thinking about a lot as well yeah. in my work. I mean, it, it, so in, I interesting question, interesting. right? But 
you know, f for us it was obviously, you know, we, we just had as many HoloLens as that we had at the moment, totally. right? Totally. Um, we deal with that in music a lot. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I, I guess really depends on kind of what you're working with, right? I think for, obviously, you know, what, what, what I presented today, actually now I realized it kind of goes from one end of the spectrum to completely the other where obviously the later projects, uh, the immersive environments, you'd want everyone to have it, right? Whereas kind of the fabrication ones, I think they're a bit more kind of material specific, right? So sometimes you just don't want everyone to have it, because not because of any kind of power structures, but rather just because of efficiency in the assembly process or in production, right? Where it's just kind of more efficient that you reduce uh, the, num the, the amount of noise in the process, let's say. I'll wait for the mic. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, we currently have a, a lot of students that are very interested in how augmented reality can uh, improve conditions for humans. Um, and I see there's a lot of fun to be had in, in this. There's both um, new and sensorially complex and invigorating constructions. And then there's a kind of gaming, gamifying of the built environment. But I also see potential for, like, instead of adding complexity to the environment, which is what most of this is doing currently, is simplifying the built environment. Like, you could actually create environments that are more suitable for wayfinding or for, you know, reducing the kind of sensory overload that a lot of people uh, have have you gone in that direction, or any of your research, or your students working in that direction? Well, I'm, I mean, that, that's something that that we keep talking about, also kind of at at the school. You know, it's uh, when is it a bit too much of stuff? Just kind of, you know. But we as architects, we want to design something and, and kind of visualize new things. Uh, but one of the projects that I was showing does kind of uh, pose that question as well, right? Of the of the kind of erasing of. Um, of data or erasure of uh, information, right? Kind of reducing, hiding rather than adding. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, that's kind of super interesting avenue. Like we didn't really pursue that much more after that, but kind of the question is there. I could imagine uh, someone with any kind of sensory uh, challenges using my city, my friend, literally as a friend in the city to help them get places, to help them avoid danger, to help them interface and actually even make it a more pleasurable experience overall. Um, so it would add the right kind of information, mm. you know what I mean? And yeah. pleasure. I mean, yeah, for, for us, there was, there was a very interesting topic because, you know, for two years before that, we were working with kind of creating these static images, let's say, but then if you're already creating this ecology, why wouldn't you, you know, um, create living uh, digital creatures as well to contribute to the whole kind of city ecology or the digital uh, digital urbanism in that way, right? Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, so I have two questions. The first one was uh, about the steam pump pavilion and I was wondering if you could imagine, because like later in other projects, you show how also the, not just the product of the process would be a product, but also the process itself can become a product, like these, uh, these um, wearable arms. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, this could also happen, for instance, for this uh, Steampunk Pavilion, where you, you can imagine that I could, uh, I don't know, uh, buy this, uh, this steamer and the, and, the, and the bag and the, a bunch of, uh, of uh, wooden, um, uh, yeah, and then do it in my own uh, in my own place or somewhere else. Also, that if this could be exported, so this would be one question. And one other question, perhaps related to the question that was before, is concerning augmented reality. I was wondering if you think that the introduction of augmented reality could, um, for instance, emancipate and relieve uh, the uh, built architecture, so to say, from certain thing and could transform it. So since everything, uh, so, so since many things can be then, uh, let's say, um, transferred to this virtual area, 
would this do you think this could per, for instance change the way architecture is built so for instance having not no no more uh, uh, orientation systems for instance in, in in the built one or having uh, i don't know different kind of windows i don't know if you ever thought about yeah i mean that would be a dream right you don't have to photoshop out wayfinding anymore from you know, the, the photos of your final uh, built object but um, on a more serious note yeah i i think that definitely there's kind of there would be some implication, right, on the way that we also design physical architecture if, if kind of the, you know, the mixed reality architecture really becomes a thing, right? And, and I see it way more as something much more realistic or closer to, to humans than kind of the, the whole virtual metaverse um, because I, I think that's kind of the actual power of, of use of these technologies, right? In, the mixed reality and overlay rather than just kind of, you know, sitting in your room and, and uh, playing video games, right? Uh, and then to go to your first uh, question, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question, but it's like, how am I gonna stop you also from just doing that, you know, yourself, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I think kind of the choreographing the whole process is definitely interesting, right? So I, I don't know if I really, because I see it more as a comment than a really yeah, a question. Yeah, no, of course I could do it myself, but in the way, so you were more, I, I have the feeling you were uh, more interested in, let's say, expanding the, the different ways in which you, one could create uh, uh, with inventive uh, instruments, let's say, fantastic products. And then my question was, was like, could this become, a, so the, 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 the process itself could become a, pro, uh, a product that then you, you could just like, bundle and then it, right. I don't need to yeah. say yeah. uh, hire uh, or rent a big space, hire people, but somehow it becomes yeah, so, easier. But that, that's essentially the idea, right? That um, you don't need to, you know, we never steamed anything before those workshops, right? Before we did the project. Um, and the whole idea of, of these projects is that anyone can do it, anyone can learn. You don't need to print any drawing, you, need, you don't need to know how to read construction drawings or anything. All you need to do is just follow what you see, right? And, and that's kind of the, let's say, the, the goal of this agenda that we have is kind of democratization of the whole um, um, construction process in a way, right? That it doesn't matter if it's you or me or, you know, our five friends, anyone can kind of essentially uh, uh, use this tool and, and uh, build a bit nicer environment for everyone. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see the um, mix it, mixity up there. Uh, one of my other students' research is on kit bashing. He's very interested in how um, existing components or things can be recombined in unexpected ways, you know, based on kind of a Lego modality or whatever. And he came across your work already before. That actually came up. I'm curious, though, how you came up or um, how you came to the term kit bashing for that application. And did it come through academic like uh, research or did it come from just a more conceptual idea? Um, you mean, why did we specifically use kit bashing? Why, why you... Yeah, um, be, because I mean, kind of the the way that sometimes these research projects are done, like there's a loose idea, like they the team wanted to do these kind of digital overlays. And then you kind of find ways or avenues in, in which you can apply, right? And at a certain point, the question was, okay, how do we generate these overlays, right? Um, before they actually started with Mid Journey and all those things. So the idea was like, all right, so maybe you walk around the city, scan parts of buildings, create kit bash libraries out of them, and then you recombine them or, or blend them on top of other buildings. Um, but then they also started looking at Mid Journey at the same time, and we kind of like both, so, so we kept like both okay. directions. Yeah. So the Mid Journey part came in after. I yeah. completely understand that. Right? Yeah. So, thank you. So, I'm sorry, I had to step out for a few minutes. Uh, I'm sorry if you actually touched on this. But I was um, really interested in uh, kind of social applications of the form kind of shaping 
capacities of the software that you showed um, just before the final video. Um, and I wonder if you have seen any ways that these tools have been used as a protest um, instrument. I am thinking of some work that is done by mapping the images onto buildings for protest, like a few years, a couple of years, or maybe last year, there was an artist who did an installation on the Twitter building after Musk's hostile takeover, and that po posted a lot of things that drew attention to the problem. So I was wondering if there is a way that this technology can, you know, start making people re jump out of the uh, iPad and help people see injustices within the environment by mapping them onto buildings? I mean, for sure, but I, I think actually kind of this also creates sort of a, you know, a, a back channel where you can actually post things that you wouldn't be able to, you know, do on the street and, and you might actually get much larger audience, right? And kind of creating this, let's say, digital, you know, um, parallel world overlapped over the real world where you know that actually what how mixed city project started was kind of proposing you know digital graffiti right so you essentially instead of having one graffiti on a building you could have 10 or 100 right on the same geolocation and then kind of see what is the legacy of the people or graffiti that were there and so on so i i think yeah definitely it could be you know essentially i used as a form of protest but maybe kind of a digital or, or this parallel world. Sorry. Um, uh, Adil has his virtual hand up <laughs> for a while, so I'm going to let Adil ask. Hello. Can you hear me? Ah, perfect. OK. So Igor, thanks a lot for the presentation. Fantastic and really fun project. So yeah, I'm, I'm a fan now. <laughs> I'm just curious about the so the kind of design decisions that you take that are beyond the the, the techniques of fabrication, for example, the, the kind of systems you develop, et cetera, or for example, in the case of the the last project, the the kind of backend algorithmic uh, uh, setup for the for the scenario. For example, with the pavilion, how do you decide or what's the kind of motivation to make it look the way it looks? beyond its technique of production. So is it there to, to flaunt how it's made? Or is there an outside to the, to the kind of systemic fabrication logic? Or for example, in the last project, how do you decide how the NPC looks like? Why is it that it becomes this kind of globular, uh, kind of horrific <laughs> looking uh, thing? Yeah. Um... Yeah, just, just, yeah. No, I mean, great question. Like uh, for, for NPC, uh, may, maybe I should point you to my student. Uh, but um, no, I mean, you know, the, the, that, that was kind of, we all, always also give students a bit of obviously freedom and, you know, um, kind of authorship in, in taking the project to a certain direction, right? Um, so um, yeah, that was kind of, that was purely their design decision. And uh, regarding um, the pavilion, why it looks like is the way it looks like. I mean, it's a good question. Like we went through like a large number of iterations, but one constant that that let's say whichever iteration we did had to kind of answer to is that it needs to be built. Like you would need to use um, AR uh, tools to build it. Like you you wouldn't be able to build it in any other way, right? So that would kind of you know eliminate certain ways of, you know, uh, prefabricating repeatable elements that you can just kind of assemble even without AR and so on. So at that moment for us, it was, let's see how far we can push this tool, right? And then obviously, you know, there's kind of a shared, you know, let's say um, uh, design sensibility or interest in, in ways how we treat the materials that, that was kind of within the team. So I, I hope that that answered. It was a bit bit of a vague answer, but <laughs> I, I have one last and in a completely different direction. So often the things like that we make as makers, because we are architecture people, um, the fundamental, well, the the part that makes it research is when we reflect on it and we write on it, and it fits into some kind of other theoretical framework and becomes part of discourse. 
Um, a professor emeritus here, Gregory Ulmer, has a theory of understanding humans and technology uh, called electricity. I don't know if you've encountered it. It's a continuation of apparatus theory, meaning that you know the things that we make, the technology that we make, affects the way we think, and the way we think is affected, of course, and we continue a cycle of uh, advancement both in technology but also in uh, intellect. And um, electricity he poses as a, a next phase of how humans learn and understand outside of the gymnasium, which was the original intellectual origin probably of you know, uh, uh, colleges and universities. His more recent work proposes that things like theme parks and places like this are actually the places where we house knowledge uh, because the way we learn is as it's moved from words to images becomes more pleasure than uh, more traditional forms of uh, pursuit. And I think that this work fits very clearly into that. Um, so I recommend looking at it uh, as a way of continuing to think about the work and putting it into other contexts um, in, uh, in the way we learn and the way that the uh, things that we make embody knowledge. I think with, uh, with that, uh, we can let him off of the hot seat. So thank you so much.